Stanford University. Um, as you probably know, um, we're fortunate to have Dr. Rocco Mancinelli here today. Now, Rocco has a very interesting background. He also is a biologist. He's a microbiologist um, from the University of Colorado, got um, degrees in ecology and evolution, as well as molecular cell developmental. And you obviously can't do a lot of developmental work with my, uh, you know, bacteria, but it's all one department. Um, and between his undergraduate and his PhD, he spent um, a year or so as a health inspector. So you might want to quickly clean up any food that's around you and so on. We, there are wonderful stories I'm sure he'd be happy to tell you about. He arrested women who were heating up tacos with their exhaust pipe and, you know. Mere exaggeration. No, no, no. My mother calls him, you know, uh, Mancinelli the burrito bust. It's, <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's a good time to get out your Clorox and, you know, clean up, clean up the area around you. Um, Anyway, he um, <coughs> then went on and was a faculty member at the University of Kansas um, briefly and then came out to NASA as a postdoctoral fellow as several of us that you are seeing this semester did and stayed on and has now been out in the Bay Area for um, literally decades, mostly with the SETI Institute, more recently with the Bay Area Environmental Research Institute. Um, and he's done all sorts of very interesting things from nitrogen cycling, origin of nitrogen metabolism on the early Earth, um, to flight experiments. And that's mostly what you're going to hear about today. Um, a little bit about his work with the halophiles, a little bit about his flight experiments. He's the only American who's flown microbes on some of these um, ESA experiments that you've, you've heard me just sort of mention in passing. Um, so when you talk about panspermia, which you know, few people have touched on, Rock has actually done some experiments to address whether this is feasible or whether it's just a laughable science fiction idea. And so without further ado, I'm going to pass this over to Rock and Thank you. Oh, uh, come on, you can pull well, the <laughs> In preparation for this class, uh, I asked Lynn, who I think then asked Jesse to send out a couple of things to read. One was a paper on red rain that we'll discuss at the end of the at the end of my lecture, and the other one was a review article that has not quite been published yet, but will next month on space microbiology. Ooh, Is that correct? It hasn't even quite been sent out yet. Sorry about that. Oh, it hasn't? No. Oh, okay. Well, what I was going to say is that space microbiology paper is a proof. And like all proofs, it has a small number of errors in it. Such, uh, and they are really quite small. Like, uh, there's things that have superscripts that should be subscripts and a few things like that. But overall, I think it is a really comprehensive review of the state of uh, space microbiology at least as of November 2009, which is when we finally submitted it. So, uh, I'll now get on and talk about life beyond its planet of origin. And let me just grab the clicker here and see if I can figure out how to make it work. Okay. Okay. So, we're going to take a little journey today. And the journey is going to go, we're going to start at the Earth's surface, and the Earth's surface we know is teeming with all kinds of organisms, microbes as well as larger organisms. Then we're going to go up a little bit to the troposphere, and people have done that. They've sampled the troposphere for living things using balloons and aircraft. And then we're going to go a little bit above that to the stratosphere, where people have also examined it with balloons. And then above that is the mesosphere. And that's high enough that you actually need sounding rockets. Believe it or not, people who use sounding rockets to go up there and try to sample, see if there's anything alive up there. And then, of course, there's the thermosphere, thermosphere, and that's a little higher, and you need spacecraft, and then above that is the exosphere. And finally, the atmosphere just gradually dwindles out to essentially nothing, and we call that outer space. And here we're going to look at our first step into it, and see what it holds for us in the way of biology. And then I'm also going to, Lynn asked me to digress <clears throat> and to talk a little bit about planetary protection. So I'm going to talk about planetary protection and then discuss panspermia and possibly even the possibility of aliens, what they may be, where they may come from. There we go. Okay. So 
primary question that I'm going to deal with today is what is the potential for the survival, adaptation, and biological evolution in the atmosphere and beyond? Outer space or another planet? Ah, maybe I found it to work. So, to be able to do that, there has to be a first step. And what is our first step? Well, the first step really is to determine if terrestrial life, Earth life, can survive and live away from the surface of the Earth in the atmosphere, in the space environment, or even on another planet. Now, when I talk about survival, I'm not talking about, you know, being really hardy going out there and multiplying and, and, uh, and creating a, another whole niche habitat necessarily, I'm just talking about not dying. So that's what I mean by survive, not die. Not that you're necessarily in great health or anything, but you're not dead yet. Okay. So why bother? Why do we even care? Well, by studying how life may adapt or may even survive in conditions that are not really on the surface of the earth, it helps us answer evolutionary questions, such as the origin of life on Earth. In other words, how did life, really, early life, survive on Earth when we didn't have oxygen or an ozone layer? When the environment was entirely different, and a lot of people might think it actually would be more hus inhospitable. And, and helps us answer questions about panspermia, which I will define soon, and also, are we really Martians rather than Earthlings? Or if we find a Martian, would an Martian, Martian be an Earthling? And I'll discuss that too in a little bit. What is the extent of the biosphere? That's another reason why we may want to study this. We know that it extends kilometers beneath the surface of the Earth. We do not know how high above the surface of the Earth that it exists. And we also, I said this earlier, but I want to reiterate it, we also don't know that if the organisms get thrown up into the atmosphere, we have no idea whether or not they actually can multiply and divide and live there, or if they just survive. Another reason that we want to study this type of area is planetary protection. Should we protect other planets? Do we need to protect Earth? And in fact, NASA has a whole program called Planetary Protection. And oh, some of my experiments in exposing microorganisms to the space environment are funded by the Planetary Protection Office. So I have to say that planetary protection is important. And this research is important to planetary protection. So you may ask, what is planetary protection and what do we do with planetary protection? Well, briefly, <coughs> by 1962 or 1964, there was a group of people that met at a meeting called COSPAR, which is the Committee on Space Research, and they drew up a document, and this document essentially outlines what is supposed to be done for planetary protection. Okay? And essentially it says, thou shalt not go to other planets and trash them, and we shall not bring anything back to Earth that will trash or hurt Earth or, or any living creature on Earth. So, to put it a little bit differently, it really states, planet protection is to protect extraterrestrial objects from terrestrial biological contamination that may interfere with the search for extant life, its remnants, or its precursors. The second objective is to protect the Earth from the possible hazards of an extraterrestrial sample return. So this is outbound, in other words, going away, and this is inbound, bringing things back. So, <clears throat> when we talk about planetary protection, sometimes you may have heard <coughs> that we sterilize spacecraft when we're sending them to Mars. Uh, but, in reality, we don't. We don't sterilize spacecraft. Sterilization is a particular process which means that there is nothing alive on that spacecraft. So what do we really do? We really reduce the bio-load. So we take a spacecraft, 
for example, the Viking spacecraft. And I know that you've heard about the Viking mission. And one of the critical things about the Viking mission was to go to Mars and search for life. And among those things it tried to search for were metabolic processes. In other words, it took chicken soup and it took a bit of the surface of Mars and put it in that chicken soup to see whether or not anything could grow. Well, and nothing did grow. And what did that show? Well, it showed that there wasn't that kind of metabolic processes or life on Mars, but it also showed that we did a pretty good job of reducing the bioload on the Viking lander. And how do we know if we have successfully reduced the bioload? Bioload meaning biological contaminants on the, on, the, on the spacecraft. Well, there's a particular protocol that NASA follows, and you'll see an individual here actually trying to determine what the bioload is on this, on this, on this instrument. What they do is they just simply come in and they take a swab, they'll swab it, they'll then take that swab and they'll put it in some saline solution, they'll then take the saline solution, bring it back to the laboratory and try to culture things out of it. And they'll consider the thing sterile, like the Viking lander, if it has less than 30 spores of a microbe on it per 10 square meters. <coughs> Now, what has happened more recently is that the NASA Planetary Protection Office has decided that they actually need to define certain categories for missions and for planets and celestial bodies. So they have devised categories 1, 2, 3, 4, ABC, and 5U and 5R. Mission type for 1, for example, is any, any kind of mission. And what are the, what's the target that you're going to? or the solar system body, the sun, mercury, and moon. So category one means that it's the least amount of planetary protection requirements. In other words, you don't necessarily want to fly really dirty spacecraft, but they don't have to meet really stringent requirements. Whereas as you increase to a point <clears throat> at which you are going to have, say, a class 4B, and that is what the Viking mission was, a lander with life detection experiments, for example, as you might send to Mars or Europa, you then have to reduce the bioload significantly. And then as you increase, for example, then you have uh, class 5U, which is sample return from an unrestricted body. Okay. They handle those on a case-by-case case uh, case case basis, and examples include uh, Stardust. Stardust. Anybody know what Stardust was or is? Yes. Go ahead. The mission using aerogel to capture debris in the inter. That's right. They sent a spacecraft out into space, and it had this stuff called aerogel, which is just this fluffy stuff, and it sort of like stuck it out there, and small little particles stick to it, and they brought it back. They wouldn't expect to have anything alive in there, so. That's why it's called unrestricted body. Uh, a restricted body would be if you go to Mars and you take a rock back from Mars, sample return from Mars. So that has the highest uh, outbound and inbound uh, qualifications that it has to pass. I also mentioned something about panspermia. What is panspermia? Well, panspermia essentially is classically defined in the late 1800s, early 1900s by Richter, Lord Kelvin, and Arrhenius is that living organisms travel throughout the universe and develop wherever and whenever the environment is favorable. In other words, you've got these life entities going around throughout the universe. They find places, they settle down, they don't like it, they don't survive. They do like it, they flourish. That has a lot of problems. And a lot of people over the years have listed several of the problems. One of them is it cannot be experimentally tested. It does not answer the question of the origin of life, just puts it off somewhere else. But I think one of the biggest ones and one of the most interesting ones from my perspective and that I like to study is life will not survive long exposure to the hostile environment of intergalactic space. So what happens? in intergalactic space. It takes millions and millions of years to go from one place to another, as we've heard earlier. <clears throat> so imagine even if you're on a rock, 
and you're traveling around the universe. What happens? Well, you're, it's pretty dry out there, so there's desiccation. So I don't care what kind of a living entity you are, you're not going to be metabolizing. If you're not metabolizing, that means if anything happens to you, you can't fix it. So what do you think might happen to you? Well, I'll tell you what might happen to you. What might happen to you is you're going to get exposed to radiation. And even if you're buried inside a rock, let alone just hanging out in space with nothing around to protect you, that for a long enough period of time, you're going to absorb a lot of radiation. And in fact, that rock itself that houses you has things in it. And the cell, your cells have things in them like potassium. What happens to potassium over hundreds of millions of years? Potassium does not remain potassium. Potassium becomes something else, thorium. In the process, it gives off radiation. So there's enough potassium in cells, let alone the rock, that over hundreds of millions of years will give off sufficient amount of radiation that it will damage the cell. It'll just take things like DNA and just chop them to bits. And since you're not metabolizing, or that cell is not metabolizing, what's going to happen? You're going to sustain more and more damage and at some point reach the, point, reach the stage at which you cannot fix it any longer. So you're dead. So that's one of the real problems of traveling through intergalactic space. Sorry. There we go. So what do we do? You may hear about panspermia. Well, can there be such a thing? Well, there's the transport of life from one planet to another. And this would be more in line with what one could think of as a realistic approach to panspermia. So what you need to do then is you need to travel from the surface of a planet, such as Earth or Mars, through the atmosphere and into space. And looking at it at just your local neighborhood, like the solar system, because then it doesn't take hundreds and hundreds of millions of years to travel from place to place. Now, I said we're going to take a little journey. Well, we are. We're going to start with the troposphere. As you leave the surface of the Earth, the first layer that you come to in the atmosphere is called the troposphere. It extends to seven, between 7 and 17 kilometers. It contains most of the atmosphere. And most of the atmosphere is only in the five, first 5.5 five kilometers. Temperature decreases with altitude. And here you get air masses that rise and fall, and you get vertical mixing. Pay attention to that. That might be important later on in something we're going to discuss. And within the troposphere, there have been viable microbes isolated, <coughs> such as bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. You are all familiar with the three domains of life, correct? Okay. So all three domains of life have had representatives isolated from there. Of that is the stratosphere. It extends to 50 kilometers above the surface. Here, the temperature increases with altitude. But <coughs> I said earlier that most of the atmosphere was below the, tro the stratosphere, so the pressure, there aren't very many air molecules out there, so the pressure is very, very low. We have 1,013 millibars surface, that's sea level, and <clears throat> 0.001 within the stratosphere. The stratosphere is important because it contains the ozone layer. And believe it or not, viable microbes have been isolated from the stratosphere, mostly spores and fungi, and spores of fungi get to a spore and I'll define a spore in a moment. Mesosphere is above that. It extends from the top of the stratosphere to 90 kilometers. Temperature decreases with increasing altitude. And this is the highest altitude from which viable microbes have been isolated, 78 kilometers. And they found spores and fungi. Now, I say viable microbes, it just means they went up there, they got something, and they found it to be alive doesn't mean it's doing anything up there. Could be transient, and that's a big question. Above that is the thermosphere, which extends to 90 to 600 kilometers. That's where the space station orbits, 
Uh, it's within the thermosphere that you get the formation of the ionosphere, and it's high enough that it hasn't been sampled yet for any microbes that are naturally occurring up there, but microbes have been exposed and have shown to survive. Doesn't mean they're living well, just they've survived. Then above that, you finally get the atmosphere to dissipate through the exosphere, and you're eventually then into space. And we have not looked there for any microbes yet. So in summary, we have the atmosphere, which is mostly nitrogen and oxygen, with some other trace gases that can go down. And there's also water vapor. And most of this exists within the first five and a half kilometers of the atmosphere. If you look at, compare the absorption spectra, for example, and this is important for living things, uh, above what we consider the atmosphere, above the ozone layer, and at Earth's surface, we see here that the atmosphere actually attenuates a lot of the uh, UV radiation. Primarily, a lot of it's attenuated by the ozone layer. But what we see is a lot less than what is at the top of the top of the atmosphere. And radiation, I said earlier, is one of the things that damages cells. Well, it doesn't matter if it's hard radiation or UV radiation. UV radiation is also pretty damaging to cells. It rips cells and rips cells apart. This little limit right here happens to be not just only photosynthetically active radiation, but also that's visible light. That's what we see. Infrared is down here. The longer wavelengths you get to the infrared, shorter wavelengths are UV radiation. <coughs> and here I just want to illustrate that as you go up in, in height from the surface of the Earth, you get, a, you get a change in the temperature as well as a change in the pressure. So you go higher, you get less pressure, and you only have to go five and a half kilometers and then you don't have very much pressure at all about that. Now, I was also asked to put a little bit of extra thing here to talk about early bombardment. So what does early bomb um, the early bombardment period on Earth have to do with going beyond Earth's bounds? Well, there was something called, during the early bombardment, there was the late heavy bombardment. Well, the late was 3.9 million years ago. So why is this important? Well, one thing that happened, as I think you've heard earlier, is that Mars and Earth exchanged rocks. In other words, they were young planets, and they threw rocks at each other. I do mean billion. You know what? I wonder, uh, yeah, I do mean billion. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's billion. Not million, that's billion. I think that occurred today. Okay, sorry. <laughs> anyway, Mars, early Mars and early Earth, like two kids, threw rocks at each other. Those rocks may have contained life. We know that there were living things on Earth anyway at three and a half billion years ago. And people thought that the late heavy bombardment may have actually sterilize the earth, but now we realize, and I think right, rightfully so, that it's not necessarily logical to think that the whole earth was sterilized, that during the late heavy bombardment, when most of these rocks and comets and things were flying into the earth, that it did heat up the earth, but not necessarily sufficiently deep enough to have sterilized the entire surface. So there were, there were living things beneath the surface of the earth. Those living things uh, could be trapped within those rocks and then travel out into space and then travel out to Mars, for example. It has been shown that microbes can survive the ejection and landing process of, um, of something coming in, hitting the Earth or hitting Mars, and then spallation, which is when rocks fly back off and some of them reach escape velocity and then they can fly back off and some of them have probably reached Mars. We know that Mars has reached here. And so if you then have rocks that have 
microbes in them, and those microbes survive ejection and landing, we can call that then lithopanspermia, transfer of microbes between the solar system bodies via meteor. Litho meaning rock. And again, it would be a sufficient time period that it wouldn't be long enough to cause organisms to die of radiation exposure. So when we're talking about going beyond Earth, leaving Earth's bounds, there are two ways that I think of it. One is a natural way, and the other one is an artificial way. Natural way would be meteorites and lithopanspermia. The artificial way would be we put them up there on space, spacecraft that are not sterile. Remember, no spacecraft is sterile. Reduced bio load, but no spacecraft is sterile. So, historically, ever since we could fly things, we could fly spacecraft, we have put viruses, microbes, I didn't include, and since I'm a microbiologist, I didn't include all the plants, the seeds and the plants, exposed essentially anything that we could fit inside the spacecraft or, or sometimes even outside the spacecraft to the space environment. And what happened? All died in these early experiments. All died instantly except bacillus and subtilis spores. Now I'm going to tell you what a spore is. Here's a photograph of a spore. What happens with certain organisms that form spores, such as bacillus, is that when times get tough, they shut themselves off and shut themselves down. But not only that, they dehydrate themselves. They put themselves in a special <coughs> capsule. They put their, they actually get all of their DNA and put that, bunch that all up together too. So they dehydrate themselves, put themselves in a, in a special protective capsule, much like you might think of it as a coat of armor. And what this spore does is it allows it to be in a state of suspended animation, you might say, during the rough times, so that it is desiccation resistant. It is UV radiation resistant. And it can be, to a certain extent, hard radiation resistant. So, and it can last that way for years and years and years. So it's a way that that kind of organism really protects its spell a spore. And it doesn't really look like much of a cell, but, and it doesn't look like much if you look at it under a microscope either, but it is. You put it in the right conditions, it'll thrive. <clears throat> the classic experiment, even today, was done back in 1984 through 1984 to 90. Something called a long duration exposure facility was put up there in space. And it was there for six years. And it exposed a lot of biological samples to the space environment. One of them happened to be Bacillus subtilis spores. And it was shown that after six years, it survived if it were in a multi-layer, that means more than one layer, or mixed with a substance such as glucose. Now, if it were in a monolayer, it died within a matter of minutes. But if it were two layers or three layers, the top layer died and it protected the underlying layer. That suggests that the real killer here was UV radiation. How, and high, how high up were these? How high up was that? LDAF, that was uh, about the same area, <laughs> about 320 kilometers, about 300 kilometers, 320 kilometers. Same as space station. Same as the space station. That, by the way, is called low Earth orbit. Most experiments are done in low Earth orbit. As we get out there, even though it's called low Earth orbit, and beyond, what is this? Why is the space environment reliable? Why is it so nasty out there? Well, for one thing, it's a vacuum. So, what does that mean? Things are going to be really dry. There's cosmic radiation. There's solar wind and other sorts of radiation. There's UV radiation. There are solar flares. There are solar particle events. And it's cold. So it's not a very nice place to be if you're a living critter from Earth, where you like it to be, you know, about 37 degrees C, relative humidity about 70, 60 to 70 percent, and a thousand millibars of pressure. So, and you're protected from most of the UV radiation. The magnetosphere really protects us from the hard radiation. The ozone layer protects us from shortwave UV radiation. 
So, why is life beyond the home planet, such as Earth, on another planet difficult? Well, if you go to another planet, one of the things that you're going to encounter is a different atmospheric pressure and different atmospheric composition. You're going to have a different gravity regime. It's not going to be 1G. 1G is based on Earth, based on the mass of the Earth and the size of the Earth. It's not necessarily going to be the same temperature regime either. You're going to have differences in temperature. And you have to eat. And we evolved on this planet, so we have certain things that we like to eat. And if you go someplace else, you know, you have to make sure that it has organic carbon that you can eat, and it has to have nitrogen. Without carbon, without nitrogen, you, to eat, you can't sustain yourself. No life can sustain itself. And last, of course, but not least, is there's a different radiation regime. Both solar and cosmic radiation regimes are different. No matter where else you go, it's going to be different. So let's just look at Mars, for example as a destination planet. Temperature. It's cold. It rarely gets above freezing. Occasionally it does, but rarely gets above freezing. Most of the time, if you're there, it'll be like minus 70. So if you like to have things like frozen carbon dioxide, it's there. Radiation. It has a different radiation regime. Although Mars is further away, it's one and a half times further away from the Sun than Earth, but it doesn't have much of an atmosphere, and it doesn't have an ozone layer, so it gets more UV radiation, even though it's further away. So the radiation regime is different. The atmosphere is primarily carbon dioxide, and not only that, there isn't much of it. It's only 7 to 10 millibars at the surface, rather than 1,000. So if you're there, and I think you may have heard this before, and there's water on the planet, there's no liquid water on the planet. And if it is, it's beneath the surface, or it's very short-lived. In fact, you can have water ice. The water ice then would primarily warms up, would sublime to be water vapor. And one of the things that Viking found was that the surface of Mars tends to be oxidized. Remember I told you earlier that one of the experiments was a light detection experiment where they essentially took chicken soup and they mixed it with the surface and they tried to see if something would grow. Well, nothing grew. Something did happen, though. There was a chemical reaction. Everybody thought, aha, chemical reaction occurred. It gave a positive sign for life. But what really was happening was that it was an oxidizing surface that took the organic material in the, in the chicken soup and it changed it to CO2, just a pure oxidation reaction non-biological. And it's thought to occur, the oxidant is thought to be made by the ultraviolet radiation that's falling onto the surface material. Now, <clears throat> this is not really a digression. This is talking about organisms in extreme environments. And one extreme environment that I like to work in happens to be in salt. This particular photograph is a photograph of a gypsum halide crust. Gypsum halide essentially is a salt that forms most of the ocean and the <coughs> seawater. So what happens in the intertidal area is that the, the tide goes in and the tide comes out. The tide goes in and the tide goes out. Well, what happens is as the tide goes out, it leaves little pools of water. Those little pools of water are full of salt. The water evaporates as the salt precipitates out because of the water evaporating, what happens? It forms these hummocks. So these are gypsum halite hummocks that form along the intertidal. And if you were to go and break, break these hummocks open, what will you find? You'll find that they happen to be green on the inside. This is a scale, two centimeters. And that green is chlorophyll. You say, wow, why does that chlorophyll do it? Well, the chlorophyll is there because it's made by microorganisms, particular kind of microorganism. In this particular instance, a something called Synecococcus, 
which is a cyanobacterium. And it's a single cell cyanobacterium. So here we find in the center a green band made up of cyanobacteria. And you say, but it's in a, it's in a solid salt crust. That's right, it is. And it happens to be pretty healthy there. It enjoys being there. And in fact, one of the reasons we know it enjoys being there is because we tested it. How did we test it? And how do we know that it's hard? Well, we were working in Guerrero Negro, Baja, California, in a salt pond that happened to be across the street from this area. And we decided this looked interesting. And we broke it open, saw this green band, and said, huh, what if anybody's done anything with it? Turns out nobody did, but we didn't have time to do anything with it either. So what did we do? Well, being curious, we just took a bunch of it, put it in a plastic bag, put it in the back of the van, brought it back to the lab, didn't have, still didn't have time to do anything with it, so we put it in a cabinet, and there it stayed for nine months. Nine months in a plastic bag in a cabinet. After nine months, we decided we had a little bit of time to see if anything interesting was going on here. We took it out, and that's when we actually did the research on this to show that these organisms were alive and that they were metabolizing and dividing. And in the meantime, I was also thinking later on, after we had done this, a few years later, I said, you know, these organisms are really, really tough. If they can withstand being treated that way, then they're pretty hardy. I also work on a different kind of organism, cyanobacteria, by the way. That one is a salt-loving cyanobacteria, but it's a member of the bacteria domain. I also work on classic halophilic <coughs> archaea. They live in sodium chloride. And we were at a salt company, again, in Baja, California, and what happened is one of their salterns, just like the saltern that, that you see out here on the edge of the bay, Cargill, well, what happened is that, for some reason, all the salt, all the sodium chloride precipitated out, and it precipitated out too quickly. When that happened, it trapped all the organisms inside the salt crystal. Well, when it trapped the organisms inside the salt crystal, it's not high-quality salt. So they had all of these huge rocks, and, they, and uh, we were asked, do you want one? And I said, sure. So we can only take back one, but it was a big one. As you can see, it was about a meter long. And it's actually pink. And if you look at the center, you'll see that there's a classic cubic sodium chloride crystal, one millimeter for, for, uh, uh, for a size comparison here. And it's red. The red is due to the microorganisms. Microorganisms. These are classic halophiles, have a lot of carotene in them. Carotene, just like carrots. Beta carotene, that's what makes them red. <coughs> These organisms are alive and well and metabolizing in this salt crystal. And here's a photomicrograph. This organism right on the edge, right there, is a classic halophile in a sodium chloride crystal. And it's happy. You take the salt away, it's dead. Some people like to think, I'm going to tell you a little bit about microbial physiology. <clears throat> These halophiles, archaeal halophiles, are different than other bacteria and some other organisms. They don't have a cell wall. What they do is, instead of a cell wall, they have a membrane, a very outer membrane, and this outer membrane is really held together by ionic bonds. Those ionic bonds really are formed by sodium. So what happens is that you know, if you put these in water, you kill them. How do you kill them? Well, you dissolve. Most people think, well, that because they're used to having salt, that enough water goes into the osmotic pressure, changes in the osmotic pressure that you go in, that will go into the cell and just cause them to swell and swell and swell and burst. And that can happen, but usually before that happens is you, dissolve, you actually dissolve the sodium that's around the membrane that's holding them together and it becomes so dilute that the membrane just falls apart. So they usually just fall apart before they actually explode. That's a little digression on microbial physiology because most people don't realize that. So I thought I'd throw it in. But these organisms, in spite of that, are actually quite hardy. <coughs> 
but they do like their salt. Now this is a tree of life. You have the three domains, the archaea, the bacteria, and the eukarya. And you see a few little red lines here and there with names on them. Well, I threw that up just to illustrate that the halophiles are not some esoteric group off in a corner somewhere. That they are not so exotic. They occur in all three domains of life. And what does that suggest? That suggests the possibility that halophilism, halo meaning salt, philism meaning love, halophile, love salt, that particular trait is probably not so hard to come by and may have actually evolved more than once. And so it's found through, again, found throughout the tree of life. So they're not some uncommon thing that you could think of just an organism off in a corner that has some peculiarity. It just so happened that as I was studying these organisms, the ecology, the physiology, and the biochemistry, that the European Space Agency, ESA, came out with an announcement of opportunity for a facility that they just developed called Biopan. It's called Biopan because it sort of looked like a pan. And what it's designed to do is to expose samples to the space environment using a Russian photon rocket. And here it is unfolded. So I wrote a proposal, and I took my synecococcus from the gypsum halide crust, and I took my <coughs> haloarcula uh, halophile, the archaeal halophile, and I said, I want to expose these. I want to see whether or not they will survive. And why did I even think that they would survive? Well, the synecococcus from the gypsum halide crust, uh, I figured after treating it the way we treated it, that it was pretty hardy. And I know from my own work experience in the lab and other places and the ecology of the archaeohalophiles that they're pretty tough too, unless you put enough water on them. But aside from that, they're pretty tough. And the carotenoids, especially that the archaea have in them, are known to protect against UV radiation by absorbing UV as well as scavenging radicals. So my experiment had a very simple objective, just to determine whether or not it could survive. I'm not saying grow, and I'm not saying really be healthy, I'm just saying survive. So the question is, could they survive? Could the halophiles survive in space? at least as well as the bacterial endospores. So what did I do? Well, we took, the, we took the two types of cells, the red ones and the green ones, and we grew them. We put them on a quartz disc, put the quartz disc inside the biopan unit for exposure. We had two sets of discs prepared for the flight. One was on the top that was exposed to UV radiation in dark, as well as space vacuum. One was on the bottom, and it, I mean, one was on the bottom and it was, exposed, it was only subjected to the vacuum, no UV radiation, and we had a set of controls in the lab. Now, if we look at a photomicrograph of a dried cell preparation, and this is of the synecococcus, what you see, because one of the criticisms I had was that, well, you're just, they're just covered with so much salt that you're protecting them from UV radiation. But what I did was I dried the preparation slowly. As you dry something slowly that's in a that's, that's in a salt, what happens is the crystal likes to form, and crystals like to form perfect crystal lattice structures. It means they don't like to have any foreign bodies in between the crystal lattice. So it squeezes them out. And if you do it, that's how you get the pure salt that's commercially sellable, is that you do it slowly so that you get rid of all the impurities. And what you see here, is that the cells are actually lined up on the outside of the crystal. This is uh, a mixed crystal of gypsum halide, so it's not a really nice looking crystal. But you see that the organisms are on the outside. They're not necessarily trapped on the inside of the crystal, but they like to be near it, so they're all piled up on the outside. That's why I can safely say that the organisms are not completely protected by salt by being embedded in salt. So we took 
the unit, put it inside the biopan. That's actually the unit right there. Put it inside the biopan unit. It was closed up. It was mounted on the outside of the satellite. Uh, we had several, several flights, and this is just a matter of. Uh, this is just typical. What happened is the organisms were usually exposed about 15 days. They got a, They were completely dry, desiccated, really desiccated. Total UV dose, they got a high UV dose, a lot of uh, UV, B, and C. If you don't know it, UV radiation is divided up into three types, A, B, and C. A is the longest wavelength that is the least damaging, the least energetic. Almost all of that falls to the surface of the Earth. UV, B is a little bit shorter wavelength, a little more energetic. Almost all of it, almost all of it is filtered out by the ozone layer, but it can cause significant cellular damage. And UVC, the shortest wavelength, the most energetic, the most damaging, essentially all of it is filtered out by the ozone layer. So, but when you're up above the ozone layer, as these organisms were, you get exposed to UV, B, and C. So they got a large dose. Okay, satellite landed. That's what it looked like after landing. That's what it looked like immediately upon opening it up. And they opened it up and they sent the samples back to me. And we looked to see whether or not they were dead or alive. And we did that by growth, <coughs> by trying to grow them. We also looked at metabolism and we used something called a live dead stain, where if they're dead, they stain red. If they're alive, they stain green. And what did we find out? We found out that <laughs> Come on. There we go. And this is just an example of one of the flights that if they were exposed just to vacuum, we essentially got 100% survival for both the cyanobacteria and the halophile, the archaeal halophile. If they were exposed to UV vacuum, that means both UV radiation and vacuum, that fewer of them survived. But they did survive. They didn't all die. That's the big deal here. And this particular series of experiments happens to be uh, the first series of experiments that showed that non-spore formers can survive exposure to the space environment. Yes? Can you explain why this couldn't be done in the laboratory with the UV band? Can you, can, I'm going to ask you a question. How can you get a laboratory here on the surface of, Earth, of the Earth and actually make it mimic all of the parameters at once. Notice how exaggerated certain things. That should give you a hint. All of the parameters at once of the space environment. The fact is, we can't. We can do them maybe one or two at a time, but we can't do all of them. And believe it or not, I, I left out a series of, of slides showing the ground controls because we do a series of ground controls in which we do pull a vacuum, keep it for months, as well as expose to UV radiation as best we can. We cannot duplicate the radiation regime. We just cannot. We, we, can't, we don't have a sun. We have mercury lamps. We have a uh, variety of different kinds of lamps. But we don't have a sun. So we can't get everything exactly the same. And it's very hard to pull a vacuum on something for a very long period of time. When we do, we're doing the ground controls, a lot of times our vacuum pumps fail, or a bulb burned out, or something always happens. It's very difficult and extraordinarily expensive, but we cannot duplicate the space environment. That's why. So, first time a non-spore former was ever shown to be able to survive any kind of exposure to the space environment, period. That's why that's significant. Subsequent to that, there had been a variety of biopan uh, flights. And there's in biopan 6, there was something called Rhizocarpum geographicum, which is an epilithic lichen. Uh, and it was shown that some members of the colony survived. What really happened is that there's a, it's a bilayer. It's actually several layers. The top layer suffered severe damage and allowed the underlying organisms to survive. 
So again, it's the UV radiation that causes most of the problems. We've done a number of experiments in simulation chambers. And again, here, it's a simulation, for example, this is a potential survival on, on Mars, on the Martian surface. We have things we call Mars simulation chambers. But are they really like the surface of Mars? Exactly? No. Close as we can get, but they're not exactly like. So what we've shown here is that if we take Bacillus subtilis spores and we expose them in a monolayer under even just 12 microns of Mars analog soil and we hit it with UV radiation under desiccation conditions, in other words, a cold CO2 atmosphere, what happens? Well, we'll get initial kill off, but then there are the survival population stabilizes out because they're shadowed. And even under 12 microns of, of dust, they're protected. So they'll survive. Not saying they're happy and dividing, but they'll survive. Another series of experiments that we did was uh, we looked at Mars dust storms. You know, Mars has a lot of dust storms, and they go on for a long period of time. And they kick up dust and transport dust over the, over the whole planet. So the question we asked is, if we were to bring organisms to the surface of Mars, and it got off the spacecraft, and it went into the Martian dust, and it was at least 12 microns beneath the surface, we know it would survive. Well, what would happen if it got picked up in a dust storm? Would it die from exposure to UV radiation in the atmosphere? So we mimicked a dust storm as best we could. And what we show here is that there's a certain percentage of the population that will survive. It'll adhere to the dust. We know from experiments on Earth looking at microbes in the atmosphere that if the atmosphere is full of particles of <coughs> dust, that those dust particles will increase the survival rate of organisms in the atmosphere. And here we see the same thing. So they will survive. So we don't sterilize our spacecraft. We reduce the bioload significantly. But if there's something that got on the surface, it could survive. And it could be picked up in a windstorm, and it could survive being trapped, being in that windstorm and travel across the planet. There's another series of experiments that are a little bit different that involve the space station. And we call this SPO, exposed, because we're exposing microorganisms to the uh, space environment again. And it's called, again, it's EC, European Space Agency. And it's called ROSE Consortium, because a group of scientists got together and we are exposing, it's called ROSE, because it's a response of organisms exposed to the space environment. Uh, and here again, we're trying to do ground simulation experiments. This is, uh, this is a ground, this is what the exposure tray looks like. We put our organisms or whatever we wish to expose in these different trays. These trays are then mounted into a platform and one platform then is sent to the space station and it's put on the outside of the space station and exposed to the environment. The other one is put in this space simulation facility. This one here happens to be in the basement of the, of the DLR in Cologne, Germany. And we expose the organisms on the space station. And why do we use the space station? Because we can expose it for a longer period of time than we can just on something like a photon rocket. It gives us more flexibility and precision in the control of the exposure limits. In other words, we actually have have filters that will filter out different wavelengths so the organisms are exposed to a particular wavelength so we can study differences in wavelength. Some of the organisms are exposed to the UV radiation not only different wavelengths but full UV radiation but also at under pressurized conditions so they're not so we've subtracted out the vacuum. And we can we can expose a larger number of test samples. And again it's on the outside. That's why it's called the EXPOSE, the ESA EXPOSE facility on the outside truss of the space station. There we go. <clears throat> One that's a little bit closer is called OREOS satellite. That's a NASA AIMS satellite. It's called exposure of the organics and organisms and their response to the uh, outer space environment. This is, it's a little box. It's only this big. 
the difference with, between this one and the other ones is it's not coming back, and it's not going to be in low Earth orbit. It's going to go above low Earth orbit, and it's going to stay there. So what we're doing is we are <clears throat> going to expose organisms and some organic material to the space environment, and simply for the, I'm part of the organism experiment, so I'm taking halo files and I'm throwing them up there. But instead of being in a, they're initially put up there in a dry state, then once this thing gets up into, into orbit, it is going to start the series of experiments by then putting growth medium in some wells and we're going to monitor growth just by optical density and see what happens. And the idea is to look at the effects of radiation on growth. It's going to be launched at Kodiak, March 2010 is coming up. It's a Minotaur 4 rocket from Kodiak, Alaska. Just like the Kodiak bear. Okay, so some of the conditions, it's uh, less than 10 to the minus 3G, and we will expose them to two, somewhere between 2 and 20 uh, grays over a total of six months uh, in, the, in the exposure facility aboard this particular unit. I am flying Halo Rubrum Kobia Tor. Uh, another person is flying Bacillus subtilis spores. We're flying a wild type and a mutant of each one. Uh, this is my organism. The wild type is the one that's radiation resistant. I have a mutant that is not as radiation resistant, and we're going to see how the hard radiation will affect growth, if it does at all. Same is true for the Bacillus subtilis. Immediately upon insertion, we're going to conduct a series of baseline experiments. Then over the course of three months, we'll conduct two additional experiments to look at increases in exposure. So in summary, I'd just like to say that we, I think we've shown that terrestrial life can survive, survive, that means not die, not live happily but not die, away from Earth, in the space environment, and in a simulated Martian environment. Again, this helps address the origin of life and early evolution of life questions, such as what were real sur survival strategies that organisms may have employed prior to the evolution of complex DNA repair mechanisms. And I'd like to say that we have just taken that first step in understanding the process of life beyond the home planet. Thank you. wash the organisms and then dry them in lime or dry them in salt. We then pipette very carefully along the edge of these small tiny wells, 10 microliters. So the organism, and we let it dry. Then we go up to orbit. There is a reservoir of growth medium. The reservoir of growth medium is then pumped into these wells. And sitting above the well is a diode an LED actually, and sitting three of them, red, green, and blue. And below it is a, is a sensor that senses the amount of light coming through. So we monitor absorbance and transmittance. And that's how we monitor the growth. Once the fluid, the growth medium fluid is injected into the well, uh, we just look for changes in turbidity or optical density to monitor the growth. Does that answer your question? But, I mean, it doesn't freeze. I don't confuse by it. No, it doesn't freeze because it's heated. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, this particular unit is not exposed to the outside. It's a box that's this big, and it has uh, heaters in it and coolers. So the temperature limits are 38. It never freezes. So it never goes below, I 
with 17, 15 degrees C and 38 degrees C are the temperature limits. Any other questions? Yes. Do you attempt to control the light that they receive when they're up in space? Is that like a very important thing? No. no. Uh, on the exposure experiments, no. The Biopan series of experiments that were actually quite crude. What, I mean, it was you saw that it was placed on the outside of the satellite. The satellite, when it, it was injected into orbit, it just spun. Okay, so it just, there was, it, there was no orientation. We know what the total dose is because we had a dosimeter. The one on the space station is a little bit more controlled because it is pointing in one direction. But the space station still moves. So it's not always the same orientation, unfortunately. But we do have a dosimeter on that as well. Could you just uh, quickly summarize the steps that it would take for panspermia to work from leaving the planet to uh, flourishing on another planet? And do you think that it's ever happened? Okay. Are you talking about lithopanspermia or classic panspermia? Let's say lithopanspermia. Okay, lithopanspermia. Say when Earth and Mars were throwing rocks at each other. We know there was life on Earth. So there's a high probability that life got trapped in a, in a, in a meteor. The vacuum is so strong that it will start ripping apart hydrogens and OHs that are inside cells and make water out of it and get rid of that water. That's called anhydrobiosis. You get a series of chemical reactions that will occur that way. So it's very dry, desiccated. So it has to, okay, so say this organism can withstand the desiccation. What's next? Radiation. If you're on the outside of the rock, you're going to get hit by the UV radiation. So you're going to have to have something to protect you. If you're inside the rock, you'll be protected from the UV radiation, but then there's the cosmic radiation, the solar particles, all of those things that can still do you in. So then you start calculating probabilities of survival. Probability of getting hit by a particle. Probability of, of you're not sustaining sufficient damage that you can't repair it. So you then go through space and if it's, if it's a short enough period of time that you're not going to accumulate enough damage to that survival is impossible, you then land somewhere. When you land somewhere, the rock is going to come down through the atmosphere. And it's going to heat up as it comes down through the atmosphere. Modeling studies have shown that a certain amount of rocks raining through the atmosphere of a, of a sufficient size are not going to heat up that much as you're coming through the atmosphere. So you're not going to fry. Some of them will, but certain percentage that will not. So you have to worry about frying on the outbound, radiation, desiccation during travel, and frying as you're coming in. If you survive that, then you have to look around and say, okay, if you're on the inside of a rock, there's nothing necessarily to eat on the inside of a rock, so you have to wait for it to weather away a bit, and you have to escape. If you escape, is there anything you have, then you have to go through the checklist that I showed earlier. Is there something to eat? Is the atmosphere conducive to your survival? If it is, if there's something to eat and the atmosphere is conducive to your survival, then you're probably going to be able to multiply, divide. If not, you might be able to survive, but that's about it. Do I, what do I think of the likelihood of panspermia occurring? I think the likelihood of panspermia occurring outside the solar system, in other words, going from solar system to solar system, I don't think it ever occurred because it's too far away and it takes too long and any living entity would uh, accumulate too much damage. Do I think that there's a possibility that live uh, cells have been transform transferred from Earth to Mars? Yes. And in fact, people calculated that. I just don't remember the number off the top of my head. Do I think that, uh, and we know that there are rocks that have come from Mars here. So yes, I think that life, that panspermia has <coughs> occurred on living microbes from Earth to Mars. Whether or not they've done anything on Mars remains to be seen. Okay. And let's quickly go through the next, the red rain paper.
about that. Hope everybody read the red rain paper. Okay, we're going to do this. This is actually easy to do. Uh, in September 2001, there was rain. The rain just wasn't like regular rain. The rain was red. So, when you see blood red rain falling out of the sky, people wondered, what is going on? So, it was sampled and examined by microscopy. Very good thing to do. Uh, in this paper that you should have read, you, you should have, they, they did a number of tests. They looked at it. They did an absorption spectrum. They did uh, chemical analyses. And they did a thidium bromide to look at nucleic acids. So, I'm going to ask the question. You read the paper. What do you think? Well, are there any strengths? Did they do anything right in this paper? Don't all speak at once? Yes. They took rainfall data over after. They took what? Rainfall data. They did. But biologically, did they do anything right? Yes. They sort of tested to see if there was DNA in the... Well, yeah, they sort of did, but the pro they did. They did, I mean, they did a number of things that were right. Uh, they the looked at mind, you should be all over this. They looked at it. They said, huh, this looks like it's a biological entity. That was right. They then did a number of tests to determine, try to determine what it was. So they did a few things right. Did they do anything else right? Yes. And they correctly predicted the elliptical pattern that an asteroid um, explosion would cause over the area to cause that rainfall. But they didn't explain how it could repeat that cycle. That's that correct. Uh, so, what did they do wrong? If you were given this paper, as people were, I mean, you write it in, in, in in science, what do you do? Well, you write, you do research, and then you write it up. And you write a paper, you say, we did this, this, and this. These are our results. These are our conclusions. Uh, papers are sent out for peer review. As a peer reviewer, you look at this paper, you say, did what they, was what they done worthwhile scientific investigation? Yes. Uh, did they conduct a number of tests? Yes. Were all of those tests the right tests? No. Were some of those tests the right tests? Yes. Okay. Then you get to the results. Did they report results that you think were bad? Or do you think that the results were adequately reported? How many say yes? How many say no? Yes. yes. How many say yes that the results that they reported adequately f reflect the tests that they conducted. Well, I think they actually, if you look at the results, yes, the results that they reported really were the results of the tests. They made a couple of errors. Anybody want to say what those errors were? Yes. One of them is they only used one of two methods to test for DNA RNA. They used the thidium bromide. Yes. Is that a good test for looking at DNA? For everything that's um, not algae? Not not well, you almost got it. Thidium bromide, what a thidium bromide does, it's a fluorescent dye. <clears throat> if you have DNA, it interpolates. That means it gets in between the grooves of the DNA. And if you hit it with the uh, right wavelength of light, it fluoresces. It glows. And you say, aha, DNA. They didn't see anything. They used the thidium bromide, but they didn't see anything. They looked at it in the microscope. They, didn't, they said they didn't see anything. They did. They looked at it using uh, electron microscopy. They say they didn't see anything really worth much, but they did. They saw some envelopes, and they saw a few things here and there. What do you think their main problem was? I mean, they did all these tests. They showed some results. They did some tests that were the right tests. They did some tests that, that gave them data, correct data, but it didn't tell them anything. And why not? If you had to review the paper and it was sent to you, what would you say? 
question. I know we have biologists in the room. Well, I, I think my general impression from reading the paper, not maybe from many, for many different reasons, was that they had a few conclusions that they jumped to. They made some strong statements like these were similar to fungal spores, but there's no chance that they could have been that. And I didn't feel they were really substantiated well, a lot of Well, you're, you're sort of on the right track. First thing is they weren't biologists and they didn't go ask a microbiologist anything. That's their first mistake. <coughs> they were untrained to do the research that they were trying to do. And they didn't seek help because it, they were looking at biological, they got it right. They were looking at biological entities. Yes. But they didn't realize that what they were looking at was spores. That's why the methyl green for looking at a nucleus didn't work very well. I don't know if they did it properly, but it wouldn't work well looking at a spore. That's why when they tried to do the ethidium bromide, they probably didn't do it quite right because the spore is too hard and it won't go in. So, uh, there are a number of problems with it. Uh, they claimed that, they, that there were cell walls in the mucus layer, yet there were no proteins or lipid analyses done. They didn't do all the quite the right, the right analyses. They never did a sugar analysis. Are the re elemental analyses data reasonable for an organic compound? They missed one critically important element that life needs, and it is in carbon. What's another one that life needs that they didn't analyze for that they should have? Did I hear it? Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, and on the ascidium bromide test, they should have shown a photomicrograph using fluorescence microscopy rather than just a graph. Because that's really what you look at. I mean, there are a number of things that were wrong. <clears throat> when this article first came out, I was interviewed on a radio station. And it just so happened <laughs> that it must have been also aired in India because I got a letter from, the, uh, from one of the authors of the paper who wrote back to me and he didn't like what I had to say. Uh, he's a co-investigator investigator on that paper, and uh, he heard me talk about this paper, their paper, and he says here, according to you, me, we have not looked at looked the DNA. I, I didn't edit it. Okay, this is just verbatim. They didn't look at the DNA under the microscope after you're sitting bromide thing. The answer is yes, we did it, but it is not glowing. <laughs> well, that means that they didn't do it right. So we did a more accurate method for DNA detection using fluorescence enhancement by fluorometric technique. That's not necessarily true. Okay. So, uh, acetium bromide is two extinctions, one in UV and the other one at 500 nanometers, which is higher than UV. That's true. Even a picogram of DNA can be detected using this method according to the manufacturers. That's why we followed that method. We tested more than 10 biological samples as controlled. All samples showed fluorescence enhancement except the red range cells. Again, we gave cultured, we have cultured this organism at very high temperature. We got some stunning results. We're about to communicate those results, personally saying these are definitely extraterrestrial microbes, which we are not, which are not known to us. It needs more work to say scientifically. Well, they have never published another paper. However, they seem to be totally unaware of the fact that the Indian government was conducting uh, another set of analyses and actually they published it, they published it in 2001. And what they found was that the rainwater was colored by spores from a locally prolific aerial algae called Trentephala. Now, <clears throat> the key here is that they were looking at spores and they didn't know they were looking at spores. All they had to do was go ask a microbiologist and they'd look at it under the microscope. You look at those things, they're spores. They're not vegetative cells. And that's why they didn't behave. That's why they didn't take up the ethidium bromide. That's why they look <laughs> strange to them under the electron mic uh, microscope and under the microscope. Okay, these spores <clears throat> is known to be, they can be red, green, uh, yellow, or black. Uh, and it was estimated that at least a ton of spores fell in the rain. And there were no meteoritic debris found in the samples. Okay. That's another strong hint. So if you look at this, this is actually out of the government report. Frames one and two show the spores uh, that are colored. Uh, frame three 
is the red rain sample with the spores at the bottom of the of the little uh, uh, bottle there. B is uh, what happens when you allow the water to evaporate. You get a, a puddle of spores or dried a dried plaque of spores, and C. Uh, are the spores suspended in the rainwater. And then if you actually take those spores, then you put it on ordinary growth media, I mean it was not anything exotic, they got them to grow into their vegetative state, into known organisms. So this organism is a green alga. The chlorophyll pigment is masked because it has a lot of beta carotene, just like the halophiles. So if we look at the extraterrestrial hypothesis, we see that it, it rests on the assumption that a loud thunder and flash of light during a storm was an exploding meteor. However, I think a better causal explanation for a thunderous sound and flash of light during a storm is thunder. Always go for the most obvious. So just the fact that the colored rains fell sporadically over three months refutes a meteor burst event as the cause. Because you're not going to have that much uh, meteor shower coming in spore, spurts like that over three months. So given that the spores grew in culture into a known species of algae, the extraterrestrial hypothesis seems to be without factual grounding, in my opinion. But there are some unanswered questions, and that is how did so many local spores contaminate the rain, and why in only scattered areas during the 2001 <coughs> monsoon? Well, it's known that there was high rainfall weeks prior to that, and that caused an algae bloom and spore release. Spores can be picked up by the wind and contaminated in the rain before they fell from the clouds. And if you remember early on, what did I say? One of the things that happens in the lower part of the atmosphere is you get mixing. You get you get currents, air currents going up, bend down, and up, bend down. And so, if there are particles in the air currents, they're going to be carried along with it. So that means that not everything's going to rain out all at once. So it probably relates to vertical mixing in the troposphere. And now, I left, I'd like to add that a big hint when you get a paper like that is if they really found extraterrestrial organisms, don't you think this would have been in science or nature? Don't you, you know, the fact that it was the, you know, a, an Indian physics journal is no, no offense meant to the physicists in the room. But that's highly suspicious. There are a whole bunch of cues there that should have sort of sent up your, your antennae. And the reason we're spending so much time on this is you will see reports like this probably for the rest of your life. And we're hoping that you're finally tuning your, your credibility meters in this class so you can say, gee, you know, that just doesn't smell right to me. Or yes, this is something really exciting worth our time. Yes, the picture is amazing. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.